other one, Ibu Dre from the Philippines, the journalist of uh, Manila Times from the Philippines. So I'm really thank you for the distinguished uh, speakers who are already giving their valuable time to be with us today. So uh, without uh, further ado, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Uh, Carmen as a representative from Non-Violent uh, non Peace Force from the Philippines who collaborate with uh, Serve Indonesia and PAKAR. We are actually, this program is collaborations between three organizations in Southeast Asia. So then I welcome Ibu Memen to give uh, your opening speech to the participants for this program. The floor is yours, Ibu Memen. Hello, Ibu Memen, are you hear me? Do you hear me? Hello, Ibu Memen. Hello. Okay, uh, Ibu Memen, are you with us? Yeah, okay, so she's already there. So yeah, okay. Please, uh, I already opening the, the discussions and then this is your time to give an opening remarks for the opening for this discussion. Please, the floor is yours, Ibu Memen. Hello. 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 Good afternoon. <laughs> Assalamualaikum. Salam. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you very well. Sorry, because I think my computer problem is now on the audio side of my laptop. So I'm now turning into my phone to speak. So I would like to thank everybody for coming to this webinar. So as you can see, we are tackling a very controversial and very sensitive topic for this afternoon. I would like to thank our partner for collaborating with us in hosting this series of webinar. We are actually on our third series. So thank you very much, Serve Indonesia and PAKAR, the Center for Radicalism and the Radicalization Studies in Indonesia, and especially to our partner, the Royal Netherlands government for supporting us in this initiative. So I would like to welcome all of you to this webinar on the role of women in terrorism financing how governments and CSOs have responded. On behalf of my organization, the Nonviolent Peace Force in the Philippines, I would like to thank and extend our heartfelt gratitude, not only to our collaborators, our partners in this project, but also to our speakers who positively respond who generous, generously accepted our invitation to speak and share with us this afternoon in this webinar, their, their expertise, their sharing their knowledge on the topic. So without too much introduction, I would just like to proceed to our discussion proper. So I would like to welcome all of you in this webinar. Thank you very much for coming. I hope this will be a very insightful, productive, and informative webinar. Terima kasih banyak. Maraming salamat po. Thank you. Maraming salamat po, uh, Memen, for the opening remarks. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Uh, so, because I believe this discussion, this is like Memen said, this is a sensitive issue sensitive discussion and I think we are really want to know what is the finding what is uh, what are the speakers will share with us so I will not speak too much uh, too long because it will consume the time so I will hand over this floor to our moderator our senior journalist from Malaysia 
amateurs is very uh, how to say a uh, very long uh, experience in journalism and she's very famous so i give it the floor to amy Chu. so amy the floor is yours to moderate this the whole session of this uh, today webinar amy the floor is yours terima kasih pak dete terima kasih yeah hello um Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very honored to be moderating this session, uh, to be in the company of, uh, of great women, uh, but Dete is one of them. She is very passionate and compassionate about her work in uh, counterterrorism in Indonesia and contributed a lot um, to, the, to the issue. And uh, we are here in the company of great women. We have here uh, about Sylvia Lakshmi from Indonesia. Um, and then we have Drea Toledo from the Philippines. And then we have, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Police, uh, Norma Ishak from the Special Branch of the Royal Malaysian Police. And uh, all these great women always have uh, support from the ever the gentleman, uh, Bapak Pribadi Sutiono from, uh, from Indonesia's uh, Chief Security uh, Ministry. Um, without much further ado, I would first just like to quickly introduce the, the speakers and, uh, and give a very quick overview of, uh, of the other uh, terrorism picture and women's involvement in it. From Indonesia, we have Sylvia Lakshmi, uh, who is an expert in the field of anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing. Since 2007, she has worked as a senior analyst in the Indonesian government and specialized in the area of financial crimes intelligence investigation. She's also an established trainer who has provided training to government officers and private sector specialists, domestically as well as internationally. She's currently a PhD candidate at the Australian National University, examining Indonesian counter-terrorist financing policies and their impact on terrorist operations in Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific. Drea Toledo uh, is a journalist for the Man Manila Times Hello, uh, I haven't seen her in a while, but she's a really awesome uh, journalist uh, whose research involves studying the phenomenon of child soldiers. And she endeavors for the Philippine government to have a concrete de-radicalization program focusing on children and women as part of the national and regional preventing and countering violent extremism action plans. And from Malaysia, Oh, we are very honored to have a Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner of Police, Norma Isha, who is the first woman to be appointed to head Malaysia's Special Branch Counterterrorism Division, the intelligence arm of the Royal Malaysia Police. She was appointed to a post in April last year. Prior to her current post, she was the Je Deputy Chief of the Division. She started her career uh, at the Royal Malaysia Police in 1991, serving as a desk officer for Far East in the External Intelligence Division of the Special Branch. After serving for 12 years in counter-espionage, counter-intelligence work, she was transferred to the Protective Security Division where she was deeply involved in a wide range of protection work in various capacity. She's also trained in nuclear security matters and participated in many of the engagement activities organized by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And just speaking as a woman from Malaysia, uh, we are very proud to have uh, a woman, to the first woman to hate the counter-terrorism uh, division of the special branch, which is a major milestone for the Royal Malaysia Police. And from Indonesia, we have Bapak Sutiono, Pribadi Sutiono. He is the Acting Deputy for Foreign Policy Coordination and Assistant Deputy for Asia Pacific and Africa Cooperation at the Coordinating Ministry of Politics, Legal and Security Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. Uh, Bapak Pribadi has given a lot of his time uh, in support of all the de-radicalization work by civil um, organizations like SERF and PAKA. Uh, he's an experienced diplomat, skilled in the issues dealing with negotiations, government, countering terrorism, public diplomacy, 
Chinese politics and humanitarian work. His foreign postings include Brunei Darussalam, London, and Japan. And just very quickly, uh, this webinar is coming uh, at a, is very, very timely. For the last one and a half years, the COVID-19 pandemic has made many people stay at home. And according to the latest report from, from the UN Secretary of Security Council, our terrorism and terror activities have been artificially suppressed by all these lockdowns, which have severely restricted um, travel. And this webinar comes at a time when the countries are slowly reopening. And as we all know, that women's involvement in terrorism financing in Southeast Asia have been very active and have been increasing. Uh, in Indonesia, we have seen foreign workers uh, who have been recruited online uh, where by men from militant groups promising them love and friendship. And these women, once they are in the trawl of the men, they gladly donate their earnings to the men. And in 2017, we have seen the Marawi siege in Southern Philippines, which was ISIS's most serious assault um, in Southeast Asia to gain a foothold. And uh, the, the siege was led by the Maute group, but the funder of the, of the attack was actually their mother, Fahana Maute. So without further ado, uh, I now open uh, the webinar for all these um, amazing speakers to tell us um, about, uh, about the financial terrorism by, by women in Southeast Asia. Uh, I would like to first welcome Sylvia Laksmi to speak on the role of Indonesian women in financing terrorists and its network in Southeast Asia. Uh, Sylvia, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Amy, uh, for the very good introduction. Um, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sylvia Laksmi, a PhD scholar at Strategic and Defense Studies Center, the Australian National University. I'm glad to be here today where we could exchange our knowledge about the involvement of women in supporting terrorist financing. So what makes it unique about the engagement of women in funding terrorism? Recalling back to the latest uh, bombing incidents, the suicide bombers engage their wives and children as martyrs. We will talk about the capacity of women to function as primary social agents in developing violent radical values for supporting the financing of terrorism. The government and the society often neglected these women's abilities and would rather have biased perspectives on women as perpetrators or as a victims. For decades, the Indonesian authorities had identified the involvement of Indonesian women in terrorism. In the Jama Islamia era, uh, for instance, terrorist wives have been viewed as loyal supporters for the organization, starting from their migration to Afghanistan to their expansion into Southeast Asia. Today, before we talk more about the role of women in terrorist financing, we could revisit the definition of terrorist financing as stated in our law. The law number nine uh, year 2013 is about the specific law of anti-terrorist financing. For short, terrorist financing refers to the activities that provide financing or financial support to individual terrorists or terrorist group. Uh, in the slide, as you can see, uh, there are three stages of terrorist financing referred to the Financial Action Task Force on Money Laundering Recommendations. Uh, uh, I, I, I won't uh, explain in detail about that, uh, but for sure, the, the, the first step is about source of fund, how, you, how the terrorist group raised the money, how the terrorist group moved the money, and how the terrorist group used the money. So previous, uh, okay, next slide. Previous observations on terrorism cases revealed the four types of motivation of women who joined the terrorist group. I put here the first one, they joined a terrorist group to support their husbands who played an important role in these groups. Marriage alliances, including in Indonesia, were the most strategic way to impart the fundamental ideology to family members. The second motivation is the bonding among women fighters through friendships. Like their male counterparts, female terrorists were also encouraged by the social connection that they had developed among their peers. They could develop their connection through social interaction on the campus or as relatives of activists and even their co-involvement in crimes. The third motivation is self-actualization against saturated feelings and grievance. 
this sensation emerge as they attempt to find a way out of socioeconomic inequality, psychosocial issues related to unfortunate life experiences, like losing a loved one, patriarchal authority, domestic violence, or even the dishonor of being raped. Lastly, a strong desire for female emancipation also becomes a critical motivation for women who strongly envision themselves as terrorist fighters or terror group supporters. At the global level, an expert, Katarina Nate, discovered that the attraction comes from their independence, also from parental control and Western operation. Now, uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the Indonesian cases, I investigated three prominent roles of female terrorists. Instrumental support was identified when the women provide tangible matters or services, including funds, fighters, materials, or shelters. Operational support consists of the skill to prepare and execute an attack, including making a bomb or explosive materials. Lastly, organizational support includes the efforts of women in contributing to the organization in terms of providing socio-cognitive and interpersonal aspects of network expansion, recruitment, propaganda, and spreading the exchanges of ideas and access to, to the information. Next slide, please. The first one, we can talk about the instrumental support. This is the active role of the women. The first case, as you might know, Jumiatun or Umi Delima, the wife of Santoso, who was a prominent former leader of MIT group in Poso. Not much information about her actions was revealed in the investigation report because the questions were mainly related to the husband's activities. However, in relation to the terrorist financing aspect, some facts were also not for the examine yet, such as her knowledge about the long barrel or weapon stocks or bombs, the international money transfer related with the Abu Sayyaf group in the Philippines, or even the information of a bundle of money that she received during military training. Another example is Rosmawati uh, or Umi Yazid and Agustiningsi, who was convicted of terrorist financing crime because of her involvement in the fundraising activities for operation and logistics. Rosmawati was the wife of Hassan Jiz Zahabi, an active member of Santoso Network. She organized the fundraising from members of our terrorist group and she used the money for operation and logistic of the MIT POSO network, including support for the widows, the wife of jihadis and terrorist inmates. Agustin C, she attended a recitation group created by Abu, Abu Hamza, a terrorist fighter live in Syria. She believed on the group's vision and mission and she sold her house and properties to finance her travel to Syria. She initiated the meetings and organized foreign terrorist fighter uh, travel with all her, her fellows. Next. Slide, please. Second one, the instrumental support, but in passive role. The first case, this is a popular case, the case of Cahya Fitrianta, a male terrorist. He had an investment website together with his syndicates by activating the non-active members and obtaining their security identities like username and password. They successfully generated fund up to 50,000 US dollars and transferred the money to some fake accounts and the accounts of his wife, Nurul Asmi Tibiani. Next slide, please. The second case is a similar case was also found in the Surakarta bombing incident, which involved Muni Kartono, Dwi Atmoko, and Nur Rahman. Bahru Naim, a prominent Indonesian leader who pledged uh, allegiance to ISIS and already live in Syria, ordered Munir to organize fund remittance to, from Syria to Indonesia using PayPal. Munir then managed the fund by partially transferring it to his wife's account. They plot the money for preparing a bomb to be exported in the local police office in Surakarta. The next role is in uh, operational support. The cases of two former domestic workers, Dian Yulianovi and Ika Puspitasari, exemplify this form of support. They were convicted for their failed attempts to conduct suicide bombings in Jakarta and Bali. Interestingly, both acted on behalf of pro-ISIS elements. Their husbands played important roles in instigating their participation in such attacks. Dian was likely uh, acting in support of Jemaah Ansarudawla, which her husband Solikin was a member of, while Ika was imprisoned for her support of Katiba al-Iman. Besides providing operational support, Ika also offered instrumental support by assisting a terrorist court cell led by Abu Jundi in purchasing weapons, ammunition, and explosive materials. Next slide, please. In terms of organizational support, we have Tutin Sukiyarti, 
a formal herbal therapist. The district court sentenced her to five years because of the terrorism conviction. But since 2006, she actively joined a recitation group in West Java and expand her influence on the community by using a Facebook group called Infak Daula. She is the, the, the one of the women who had a similar understanding about Daula Islamia and raised donation for the terrorist prisoner's wife. In 2017, Indonesian women were also found to actively support uh, supporting ISIS through Yayasan Infa Daula Center. It is established in uh, 2009 and also through a public fundraising movement called Gerakan Sahari Seribu. The modus operandi of fundraising was, social, was through social media campaigns, such as on Facebook, private forums, on Telegram, or WhatsApp. Both programs were aimed at ensuring the well-being of the wives and widows of terrorist prisoners. The focus on women and children enabled this group to build emotional connection with them, uh, which perhaps is the transmission of extremist values to the next generation. Uh, next slide, yeah. In terms in the, uh, at the global level, uh, it's also happening. The first case was in 2015. Six Bosnian immigrant women were convicted approximately for 30 years in prison because they sent money to ISIS and Al-Qaeda for supplying military equipment for the group's base in Rockford, United States. Secondly, in 2016, Muna Osman Jama and Hinda Osman Birane were also punished by the court because they conspired together for providing material support for Al-Shabaab, a terror group in Somali. One year after, another mini police woman was also penalized of similar indication. With parallel accusation, the local authority arrested some other women for the same region and imprisoned, for, uh, imprisoned them for uh, 11 to 12 years. The next came about in, in Karachi, Pakistan. A women group actively raised money for Daesh and remitted to their husband's account, the radical readers. This women group established an academy which consisted of 20 women who was mandated to organize and collect money, but as if it is for donation or zakat. Lastly, an American woman was convicted of using Bitcoin for money laundering before sending the fiat money to the ISIS group. She had laundered more than US of more than uh, 85,000 US dollar by conducting fraud and money laundering conspiracy. Next slide, please. Now we come to the identification of future challenges. Are there more female backers? As the fact, as human beings, uh, women are portrayed as natural acquisition, irreproachable, and virtuous. History guides us to believe that women are the victims and never the agents. But the, the case that we show today, uh, it's indicated that women also play an important role in terrorist financing. There are five challenges that we could conclude from these case studies. The first one, it is important to focus on the criminalization of uh, to terrorist financing activities. Now it is lack of explorations on the individual's activities compared to the husband's activities. Whereas the observation on the cases finds that the activities conducted by those women inmates reflect the hints of involvement in supporting the group's financing strategy. The second one is the crowdfunding effort through social media platform is also another challenge found in female terrorism cases. The third uh, ch the challenge uh, was uh, there is a greater concern of migrant workers engaged with radical group. Um, the fourth one uh, is the advancement of technology in digital uh, communication and financial instrument as one of the key challenges found in examining female terrorist cases. Sorry, uh, I think uh, that's all from me. Uh, thank you so much, and we I welcome for the Q and A session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bart Sylvia, for that very insightful uh, presentation on women's involvement in uh, in terrorism financing in Indonesia. Uh, the key takeaways from that is um, the challenge facing um, law enforcement officers in the, in the use of uh, technology in uh, communication as well as in uh, and all this new technology used in, and all this new technology used in uh, raising funds like crowdfunding um, uh, also the the exploitation of migrant workers for for funds to fund terror activities um, also as well as uh, their support uh, uh, to the men 
that they are that they love or they're involved in 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 the transportation of uh, of illegal illegal arms and uh, and also uh, a key point that that was brought up by uh, by Sylvia is also how how women uh, like as we have seen uh, in the case of two Indonesian women they were both um, migrant workers uh, Dia Nulia Novi and also Ika Pita Sari they were both recruited online um, they were promised love and marriage and after they got married to their respective husbands they were radicalized to the point where they both agreed to conduct um, suicide bombings. Okay, um, from, from Sylvia, we, uh, let's move on to, um, to Southern Philippines. Uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, to present Drea Toledo, journalist of Manila Times, uh, who's also a, a friend of mine. Adrea and, and her colleague, um, Mimi conducted groundbreaking investigation into um, the, the Marawi siege and, uh, and their journalism was just uh, really amazing and, uh, and, and brilliant, I would have to say. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I know that uh, a lot of their, their work was conducted under very dangerous uh, situation. So without much further ado, I would like to present Drea Toledo um, to speak on the role of women in financing terrorism in the Southern Philippines. Drea, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amy. <laughs> uh, it has been a long time since uh, we were able to see each other in Malaysia. And so I am uh, pleased to be able to share um, my experiences um, in the Philippines uh, with regards to the terrorism financing perpetrated by women um, in Southern Philippines, as well as uh, all over the country from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And so in this particular discussion, I wanted to share um, in particular where I am coming from and why as an investigative journalist, I decided to focus my research on child soldiers and women in terrorism financing. So. Um, of course, Amy already knows me from a uh, long time back. Um, for those who are only getting acquainted with me and my work, um, I'm actually the daughter of terrorist leaders in the Philippines. I am an estranged daughter of uh, the leaders of the New People's Army. So my mother is actually in terrorism financing. And uh, I began to fight back and I cut ties with my family as early as 2013. And back, back then, there was no national task force to end the local communist armed conflict um, in the Philippines. So victims of terrorism, including the family members of terrorist leaders, do not have any agency to go to to ask for help. So when I escalated this fight with my father, the leader of the New People's Army, um, it was 2017. And it was in the middle of the Marawi siege. So uh, actually, when I was um, in, in the research field uh, in Ground Zero, the last thing that I expected was that I would have to deal with the New People's Army because my research was focused on well, women and terrorism financing and child soldiers um, in the Marawi siege. And uh, at this time, the role of Farhana Maute, of course, everybody knows that um, for the Maute brothers, they were radicalized by their mother. And it follows that when a mother is, is already radicalized and sees terrorism as a way of um, gaining power in society, the children tend to take that radicalization to the next level. And it is not like Marawi siege was not something that happened overnight. And all the brothers that partook in the terrorist attacks uh, were radicalized by their own mother. And in our field research, we were able to actually track down child soldiers uh, all over Mindanao. And these child soldiers uh, were radicalized by their own mothers. And um, the sad part was that prior to the Marawi siege, the existing ecosystem um, of the 
the narco narco terrorists, those who were uh, involved in crystal methamphetamine drug distribution in the Philippines. Um, the mothers were the ones who were using their own sons as drug couriers. So these were the first batch of child soldiers that were used in Marawi by the Maute brothers. And so when we were interviewing these children, what was disheartening was that uh, first and foremost, they were they were dependent on the intake of crystal meth. So these children, and we're talking about eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old boys and some girls uh, who were already addicted to crystal meth. So they were doing everything that they were doing both for the drug cartel and for the ISIS terrorist organization, not because of any conscious um, uh, conscious embrace of the ideology of ISIS, but because of their drug addiction, which means that if you if you ask the children, if the mothers ask the children to give information, be spotters, be watchers for ISIS, the children would do so. And uh, it's, it's difficult to suspect children, even especially for the soldiers who see children and women as victims of war, as um, of course, internally displaced persons. So they are easily able to monitor the activities of the government security forces. And throughout this period, the, the drug cartel in Iligan, in Marawi, in um, the area of Lanao del Norte and Lanao del Sur, that drug cartel created a ready infrastructure for ISIS, for the Maute brothers. Uh, in 2016, when President Rodrigo Roa Duterte became the president and we waged an all-out war uh, against the drug lords, uh, pushing crystal methamphetamine in the, all over the Philippines. And our problem has, uh, of course, uh, been, been both criticized and applauded worldwide. Um, however, the impact of uh, this drug war uh, has also pushed uh, the children who were formerly drug couriers uh, to become the, the first batch of child soldiers. So in this regard, the mothers uh, who, there were mothers who consciously um, pushed their, their children and there were mothers and fathers who did not know what their children enlisted for. So we were also able to encounter situations in Marawi wherein uh, an imam affiliated with ISIS uh, actually offered an, an initial amount of 50,000 pesos. So that's roughly about 1,200 US dollars as a gift to mothers and fathers uh, in Marawi and the parents accepted it as a gift. And this happened three times. And on the third occasion that we were given this amount, then ISIS took their sons as collateral, but the, it was in the pretext that the children will be sent to madrasas for education. So there was also an element of deceit, but in most cases, and we would quantify it at about 80% of, of the cases that we encountered, that the children were actually uh, pushed into radicalization by their own mothers. We, we encountered cases where in the fathers, were the ones who were trying to get their children out of uh, ISIS. And it was the mothers who wanted the money and the children were the ones participating. So um, in this particular case, it was our mission to be able to enter certain areas in uh, Piagapo. Uh, so this is about two and a half hours away from Marawi. And when we were tracking down the remnants of the foreign fighters of ISIS. Uh, we, we've, we were able to gather some intelligence of where they were staying. And so we went to Piagapo and it was a dangerous place to enter. Even the government security forces were not allowed to enter this particular area at the time during the height of the siege. Uh, but of course, as women, we were able to enter with uh, the help of 
our linkages with the local government unit, we were able to get the support of the mayor to allow us to enter. And uh, the mayor was actually, uh, he was very forthright and he mentioned that the, the foreign fighters were already in Piagapo, but that he was not allowed to um, expose them. Otherwise they would bomb his small area. And it took him almost two decades of working as an OFW, as an overseas Filipino worker before he became mayor to go back with his own resources and cement the bridge, cement the road going to this place. So he refused to have his investment, his commitment to build his town be destroyed by ISIS, but he had to compromise and he allowed them to stay there. So when we, when we went there, um, we encountered a lot of mothers and uh, this particular, in this particular situation, for us to be able to count how many women were involved into terrorism, uh, what we did was we brought in medicines for uh, pregnant women, medicines for children, so that we could gather all the women um, from this particular town and uh, conduct some interviews. And in this particular um, mission, we were able to see that, that within, the, within the six months to nine months period uh, of the war, the women in Pegapo, a lot of them got pregnant um, by the foreign fighters and some local fighters of ISIS. So in situations like this, wherein the women um, are married for protection, so the terrorist leaders, they marry into these tribes, into these families uh, to gain protection in a certain area. So they, they pay the necessary dowry and then they get to, to intermarry. So whether these are Malaysian terrorists or Indonesian terrorists or Filipino terrorists, they marry into these families and they get immunity from, from any intervention uh, of the government because the families, especially in the Philippines, are very clannish. And there are certain areas still in the Philippines that, it, that cannot be easily entered without the permission of the, the, the local government or without the permission of the warlords the, the, in those areas. So... This is the particular situation that traps a lot of women into the ecosystem of terrorism. So in the Philippines, the phenomenon of the role of women, um, especially uh, Islamic women who are being uh, tapped you know, for terrorism financing, it's a fairly new uh, phenomenon. But what has been in existence is the use of women in terrorism by the Communist Party of the Philippines, New People's Army, and the National Democratic Front. So uh, in relation to the CPP and the NDF, uh, this communist terrorist network has only been designated by the Philippine government as a terrorist organization starting 2018. And it, as a matter of fact, the National Democratic Front the NDEF was only designated as a terrorist org this 2021. So the CPP and the NDEF, Communist Terrorist Group, has the most complicated, most complex uh, network of uh, terrorism financing, which for the most part is controlled by women, like my mother, like my aunt, my mother's older sister. The reason that it is very difficult for the Philippine government to be able to uh, have any conviction for terrorism financing in the Philippines is because of the way these um, intellectuals from universities that had been radicalized um, had created a perfect infrastructure wherein they made use of NGOs. Um, my mother, for example, infiltrated um, different NGOs from MISFI to Cairo to the peasant workers' organizations. And 
by, by infiltrating government agencies, including the Population Commission. So the Population Commission, PAPCOM, um, at the time was getting a lot of money from World Bank. So my mom was able to steal more than 200 million US dollars. And until the day that she was murdered by the New People's Army because she wanted to leave the terrorist organization and they wouldn't let her. They never got to prosecute my mother. So imagine for a single case, 200 million US dollars stolen in a span of 10 years. And the Philippine government really didn't get to uh, have any successful prosecution. There was a person who tried to file a case against my mother. And then later we found out that the person who tried to file the case was poisoned by the New People's Army. So again, that case did not prosper against my mother. So there are many cases of offshore accounts by rebel couples. So in the Philippines, uh, the terrorist organizations make use of the marriage of um, it, it, on paper, the, the communists on paper, they get married, but they also have different uh, wives and husbands in the revolution. We call it in our language, we call it Casal Sabala, married by the bullet. And in this case, the communists, they have um, multiple partners. And through this, they maintain uh, the accounts of the terrorist organizations are maintained in the names of these uh, rebel couples or terrorist couples. And so the Philippine government um, recently has created uh, the, the task force to end local communist armed conflict in partnership with the AMLAC and also in partnership with our unit in terrorism financing we are hoping to be able to have prosecutions related to uh, those that have, there are, there we, are, we have already gathered enough evidence for terrorism financing from different communist terrorist groups, but um, we are encountering lots of difficulties because of certain legal roadblocks that are being put up by the National Democratic Front. They are questioning the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, which was recently passed. So in the Philippines, um, we are doing our best to have prosecutions, to have convictions. Uh, so far, we are still waiting for the Supreme Court to grant us the legal capacity to convict these uh, terrorist leaders. So as you, if you were looking into mainstream media, for the most part, there's always uh, an unfair uh, coverage wherein there's always a uh, focus on Islamic radical groups. And personally, as a, an investigative journalist, um, I find that it is a misrepresentation because there are more uh, Muslims in the Philippines who are very peace-loving, who are not radicals, and who are really law-abiding citizens. But at least within the mainstream media, it is it, it, because of the mainstream media being deeply infiltrated by communist terrorists, there is a tendency to portray terrorism in the Philippines as something that is predominantly um, perpetrated by, by members of, of Islamic groups. But this is actually, uh, in, in reality, on the ground, the real problems of our country, for the most part, if you're going to look at it in terms of percentage, 90% of our problems is coming from the CPP, NPA, and DF communist terrorist group, and only 10% coming from DIFF, from MILF, MNLF, uh, MNLF, um, and also with uh, ISIS and the remnants of the terrorist fighters. So we are hoping um, that from the international community, we are hoping that there will be a um, global effort to stop funding the NGOs, which make use of women, because we have representatives in Congress um, who are part of the CPP, NPA, and DF, communist terrorist group. And 
they are not only making use of government resources for continuing to fund these terrorist organizations through the funding of the party list system of the Philippines, but also they are getting money from fundraising, crowdsourcing. They make use of, uh, for example, certain supposedly legitimate efforts for, uh, let's say, the community pantry, you know, that the initiative wherein uh, Filipinos would gather food and medicines and um, give it for free to neighbors. So this particular initiative started out as a, as a good initiative throughout the pandemic but it was utilized by the CPP, NPA, and the EF communist terrorist group, especially the women, the teenage girls that are a part of the CPP, NPA, and the EF to do fundraising on Facebook, on crowdfunding, and they were able to gather more than 15 million pesos. And this was happening at the time when uh, the Philippine government was already able to crack down on the terrorism financing of CPP, NPA, and the EF. And they are becoming more creative, making use of social media for fundraising and crowdfunding. And without the information campaign of the government, a lot of people can uh, be trapped into donating without, re without realizing that they are donating money to the terrorist organizations. So um, with this particular problem in the Philippines, we hope that there will be more funding focused on the study of terrorism financing specific to the CPP, NPA, and the communist terrorist group, because this is the biggest problem that we have. Uh, the communist menace in the Philippines has been around not just for 53 years. 53 years is just the Communist Party of the Philippines, but including the Hukbalahap and the PKP 1930, the pro uh, USSR pro Moscow uh, communist terrorist group. It has been around for 91 years. So they have deeply infiltrated our government and it is harder for us to have the convictions that we need so that we can, we can end the terrorism financing. But with the help of the international community, we hope that there will be more uh, focus on the CPP and PNDF terrorist financing research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dre, for that really interesting uh, uh, topic. Uh, it's, uh, well, the fact that you have your own life itself is, uh, is a counter narrative to, uh, to the radicalization in, in Southern Philippines. Um, it is very interesting to compare uh, Indonesia with Southern Philippines, uh, as Dre has, uh, has shared with us that mothers in Southern Philippines have played a leading role in the radicalization of the children, uh, and this contrasts markedly with uh, with uh, Indonesia. A very famous case was the Surabaya church bombings in 2018, where a father led his entire family uh, to carry out suicide bombings uh, in three churches. So uh, it's very interesting to see. Um, Dre pointed out that uh, most of the Muslims in in uh, Philippines are peace loving, and that 90%. Uh, of the terror activities uh, can be credited to uh, uh, the communist and communist related parties as opposed to uh, uh, Islamic uh, based uh, groups. Um, uh, the second point, uh, another point that she brought out is that uh, children from radicalized uh, families have uh, no agency to turn to, um, to ask for help uh, as she herself uh, as a victim uh, testifies. Um, uh, she also pointed out that uh, it is very difficult to prosecute um, terrorism financing and, and highlighting the case of her own mother who allegedly stole um, 200 million uh, US dollars and there was no successful prosecution of, uh, of her involvement in, in terror financing. Um, thirdly, she, brings, she also brings out the point that uh, um, that um, terror groups or militant groups have successfully uh, infiltrated um, an, a lot of uh, NGOs in, in, in the Philippines and, uh, and they've also been ably uh, assisted by, um, by the intellectuals um, uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, so thank you very much for that very interesting and illuminating talk. And oh, just one more point that I, 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 I need to highlight from Dre's talk, which is very interesting. Is, uh, is the use of child soldiers 
and how children uh, who are radicalized by their mothers were also used by terror groups to be to be spies uh, as they are easily overlooked by uh, security officers as children are seen more as uh, as victims and uh, and not likely to be viewed as a threat. Uh, we now move on to, to Malaysia uh, and where we have here with us um, Deputy Commissioner Norma Ishak, uh, who heads the Counterterrorism Division of Special Branch. And um, uh, Chief Norma will speak on women in terrorism in Malaysia and their involvement in terror financing. Uh, Chief, uh, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, Amy. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today, I was given this uh, topic, government response towards the involvement of women in terrorism in Malaysia and their role in financing terrorists. Okay, uh, here in Malaysia, people keep asking me, uh, why uh, we don't really have uh, many cases compar comparatively to uh, our neighboring countries. But I've been you know, thinking about this. I realized that we have seasonal cycles uh, here in Malaysia in terms of terrorism uh, activities. Uh, just, just like in fashions, you know, some uh, this uh, I, I just show this. Maybe it can bring back, you know, to relate these uh, terrorism activities with with fashions. You know, fashions like bell bottom can be trending in in the in the seventies, and now it comes back later on uh, in, in, in uh, at present times. So, uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, if we can see, uh, if we have a graph of terrorism in Malaysia, terrorism activities in Malaysia, we can see we have uh, two peaks and at, at least two, two valleys. Uh, this is what I'm talking about, the influential factors for Malaysia. Uh, first, we have, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about uh, communist insurgencies in Malaysia. I'm talking about the modern history in terrorism. So uh, we are affected by the by the impact of what is happening in Afghanistan during the Soviet Union time. So during that time, we have uh, our people, uh, our Malaysian uh, male uh, flock to Afghanistan because they wanted to fight the uh, jihad war against the Soviet Union. So uh, they went over there. So we have a peak during that period. So when the war is over, then when the war was over, they came back and, uh, you know, they become bored because there's nothing, uh, you know, to pursue their uh, jihadist movement or their, their, their dream for martyrdom. So they, you know, group together and they open up another groups. And then later on, it, it you know, evolved into Jama'ah Islamiyah. So that is one peak over there. So, and then later on, it became, after we have arrested that, all of them using our Internet Security Act then, and then in 2014, we can see another search uh, of Malaysian uh, involving themselves in terrorism activities when we have uh, the formation of Daesh or Islamic State in uh, Syria and Iraq. So uh, even even the, uh, we can see uh, from the, the, the Taliban 1.0 time and Taliban 2.0, there are differences uh, in terms of their own uh, memberships because nowadays even Taliban uh, take selfie, right? So it's the same over there here in uh, Syria. Uh, they have a uh, civil war, the, the infightings uh, within Sy uh, Syrian border uh, against uh, Bash, uh, 
President uh, Bashar, but the same thing happened. Uh, I, IS also is fighting uh, over the same person, but uh, for a different uh, purpose. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the statistics of arrest and action taken here in Malaysia. Uh, from 2013 to 2000, uh, uh, until the present time, we have uh, arrested uh, a total number of 558 uh, individuals in Malaysia, comprised uh, male 507 and female uh, 51 of them. And out of that 51, um, we have 36 uh, Malaysian females and the rest are foreigners. So these 36 uh, Malaysian uh, uh, females, uh, we have charged uh, 13 of them, uh, 16 has been released, uh, two, uh, were, two were detained under uh, Prevention of Terrorism Act, uh, that is, uh, you know, preventive uh, law where we detain them uh, without trial. And uh, another five uh, were detained under Prevention of Crime Act. Uh, it's the same uh, concept. It's, uh, it's a preventive law also. We have to detain them somewhere in the camp. Uh, but uh, we have five because during that time, POTA is not still enacted. So we have to use POCA for that. So, and then we can see uh, for Malaysian, what type of, you know, offenses they have been charged in court. Uh, first, uh, section 130JB, uh, bracket one, bracket A, we have five uh, personalities uh, charged. Uh, this is uh, the offense uh, of possession of items related to terrorist organization. And then section uh, 130J, bracket one, bracket A, we have three. Uh, this is the offense uh, giving support to terrorist group. And uh, next is section uh, 130J, uh, bracket one, bracket B, we have one. This is giving support for the Commission of Terrorist Act. And then we have section uh, 130JA, uh, one person that is uh, traveling through, traveling to, through or from Malaysia for the Commission of Terrorist Act in foreign countries. Uh, section 130G, and uh, this person have two uh, offenses uh, charged on, on, on her, uh, that 130G is inciting, promoting, or soliciting property for the Commission of Terrorist Act. Uh, and then uh, what Section 130KA, uh, harboring, of terrorists, section 130M is intentionally omission, intentional omission to give information relating to terrorist act. And then for foreigners, uh, we have at least one uh, person charged under 130JB bracket one bracket A uh, that is uh, giving support to terrorist group and uh, we have Three, three plus one, four, uh, being charged under the Immigration Act. So the three, they have, uh, I mean, they, they enter Malaysia legally, but maybe overstay. So they have been charged uh, due to the expiration of their process. Uh, and one was charged because she has no valid uh, document or passes. And uh, we have uh, deported uh, seven, six Indonesian and one Indian, and uh, we have to release uh, due to insufficient uh, evidence, uh, four person, three Indonesian and one Filipino. So this is basically uh, the recorded uh, statistic that we have on uh, Malaysian women involving themselves in terrorism activities. Next, uh, I just would like to talk a little bit uh, what is the you know, response uh, taken by our government in Malaysia. So up to 2012, we are still using Internal Security Act. Uh, I, I remember only uh, one woman, 
uh, involved in terrorism that we have taken under internal security act that is uh, uh, miss uh, x you know uh, the wife of hambali the indonesian gi and then uh, uh, this isa the internal security act is a law uh, that allows us to detain people without trial and uh, this case can be reviewed every two years and can go on as long as the authorities deem fit. So uh, we have been condemned for, from, from a lot of CSO, NGOs and other, other groups uh, on human rights issues. So because Internal Security Act is uh, basically uh, regressive in nature. Uh, and then uh, to improve things uh, in 2012, uh, our government passed, the, our parliament passed this uh, law called Security Offenses Special Measure Act. Uh, this is a procedural law to cater to terrorism cases, protect the rights of suspect, and for, at the same time facilitate police investigation. Uh, the, you know, the special thing about, about this uh, SOSMA, SOSMA or Security Offenses Special Measure Act is they give us the remand period continuously that we don't have to go to the to the magistrate and request uh, for extension we have a uh, continuous uh, up to 28 days so after that we need to charge uh, the suspect or we we need to release uh, him or her so 28 days uh, give us enough time to verify and confirm the commission of act prior to the arrest so i can say uh, the byproduct of this uh, uh, new act is, uh, you know, uh, we have to increase uh, the quality of our investigation. We need to uh, be at par uh, with, uh, you know, the modern days uh, uh, investigation using technologies, things like that, so that we can improve our uh, collection of evidence prior to the arrest. So this is, uh, I mean, I, I'm very glad to have this byproduct uh, at this moment of time that uh, we all strive to be a good investigators so that uh, we can really fully utilize uh, that 28 days given to us by SOSMA. And then uh, uh, all these, uh, uh, you know, the perpetrators, uh, the suspect that we have arrested, they eventually will be uh, charged under our Malaysian Penal Code, Chapter 6A, under Section 130, Section 130, we have from, you know, a, a, a listing of offenses related to terrorism, uh, full, uh, you, can, you can choose which is the most suitable. So we practice a graded approach we go for the highest sentence uh, offense, and if we, we if we cannot have that, we will go down uh, uh, gradually to the lightest uh, offense uh, based on the advice from our uh, public prosecutor. Uh, next, uh, there is uh, under under this uh, our penal code, chapter six a. There is one section uh, called Section 130JB, bracket 1, bracket A. Uh, it has been designed that way, praised as intended. Whoever has possession, custody, or control of any items associated with any terrorist group or the Commission of a Terrorist Act, you will be you know, uh, easily charged under that section because uh, in the modern days, uh, with technologies, with smartphone, people keep a lot of things, um, you know, uh, material related to terrorist group, like videos, photos, uh, PDF, uh, newsletter, things like that. So uh, this section, actually, if we look into our handsets, uh, the recording of debates uh, in, in Malaysian parliament, you can see it purpose it it this because this section used principle of strict liability, meaning it was intended that way to deter Malaysia from having accessibility to materials related to terrorist group. So 
as a law enforcer, we, we like this because it's so easy for us to charge people. We don't need to prove intent or give justification for, for possession. So as long as there is there in your, in your belongings, your possession, uh, we can uh, already charge you anytime. So uh, the bulk of the cases that we managed to prosecute in court about 80% are related to this section, 130JB bracket 1 bracket A. Next, uh, uh, yes, women are still very vulnerable. Uh, that's why uh, we do have women who, you know, migrate to Syria because uh, they are doing this for the love of their mujahids. Uh, I mean, their spouses or boyfriend, whoever. So they move to, to Syria. And also uh, for them, this is the contribution that they can do to, for the expansion of Daula citizen, citizenry through constant procreation. So meaning become jihadi bride. Uh, they dream to live in a utopian Islamic state. So they thought that is the, 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 the Islamic state that, uh, that is available throughout the world, the only one in, in Syria. So they also believe they will be rewarded for sacrificing their lives so their spouses can achieve shahid. And uh, at the same time, uh, women are physically and emotionally weak, very weak, uh, and there's sometimes lack of rationale. So uh, this is what we, 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 we found out about uh, those who uh, migrated to Syria and uh, we still have a way to monitor and constantly monitor uh, those in our whole camp. And we know that they now having that thoughts, they wanted to come back. So meaning uh, they have, their own reflection personally. Uh, and, uh, but we are stuck because it's quite difficult due to the diplomatic uh, uh, issues. We cannot, we cannot deal with Syrian democratic force because they are not a recognized entity for Malaysian government. Uh, next, I have to say that there is no terrorism financing case charged in Malaysian court for now from, from Malaysian women. But of course, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, male perpetrators, uh, you know, charged uh, for terrorism financing, but not for women. But uh, having said that, uh, we cannot uh, write off that uh, they, they do involve maybe indirectly because uh, when they are migrating to to Syria uh, in the early uh, days of IS, uh, they do take that like, personal loan from a commercial bank uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to travel there. They also have their own personal saving, meaning, meaning this, we can say that they are self-funded for, mm -hmm. for the migration. Uh, mm -hmm. Selling of personal asset uh, to buy tickets and to travel. And uh, of course, sponsored by their spouses. So Malaysian women uh, do uh, involve in terrorism financing, maybe self-funded, uh, but they are all over there uh, in Syria. So the one that we have, we are monitoring over here, uh, we, 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 have, uh, uh, we have detected a few cases, uh, but uh, since, Terrorism financing is very difficult to uh, prove. We need to be very careful uh, and very uh, painstakingly trying to, to patch things together to have a good uh, evidence so that our prosecutor, pub, our public prosecutor will accept uh, our, our desire to charge uh, a few cases that we have working uh, in hand right now. So I think uh, with that, uh, I thank you all for listening to me. Uh, I will take questions later. Thank you very much. Back to you, Amy. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Nomar. And uh, just for the audience notice that Chief Nomar accepted this invitation 
to speak for us at a very short notice. She was only informed of this on Monday. So terima kasih banyak, uh, Chief Norma. Uh, just very quickly, an overview. Um, Malaysian, uh, no women have been charged in court for terrorism financing, but uh, several of them took out uh, personal loans uh, to go to, to Syria. Uh, they also funded themselves uh, by the selling of uh, personal assets. Uh, also, um, and the other point that uh, Chief Norma brought out is, uh, is about how, um, how um, 80% of the convicted terrorist, terrorism cases here had to do with the possession of uh, materials dealing with, uh, with ISIS and, uh, and any material connected to them. And there's no need to, sh to prove uh, motivation and uh, intent. So uh, that makes me a bit worried too, because as a journalist, <laughs> we get a lot of we get a lot of stuff from all over. So anyway, uh, I know many people would have many questions to ask. So without much further ado, I would now like to invite Bapa Pri Pribadi Sutiono, the only man in this webinar who is also um, a great gentleman and a great supporter of all the women's efforts in uh, counterterrorism. <laughs> Bapak pribadi, the floor is yours. Uh, terima kasih. Thank you very much, uh, Ibu Ami. Um, uh, thank you very much for Parker and Surf also. Um, but um, you, you're right that uh, I'm a bit nervous because I'm surrounded by not only a woman, but there's a very smart and expert uh, woman. So uh, please uh, excuse me if, if I'm, I'm a bit, uh, you know, nervous on, on this in, on this occasion. Thank you very much once again. Well, uh, now I would like to, to, to just uh, give a presentation on the, what is the Indonesian government attempts to prevent women's involvement in financing terrorism. Uh, but before that, I would like to uh, take a back a look uh, first on the evolution of the women's um, activities or women's uh, ev evolutions uh, from what they call it as a, as a woman, as a, as a wife, as a mother into uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, the active uh, actors of uh, terrorism. If you know that in Indonesia, uh, it probably started from the 1980s or before that, uh, when the Darul Islam was there. Um, and well, at the time, the role of woman is still, you know, as, as a, as a uh, it's inside the house, uh, still in, in, in the house. But uh, the evolutions began changing in uh, during the 1993 2004 when the Jamaa Islamia was uh, um, uh, I think it's, uh, established at the time. Uh, the the role of woman uh, not only as a, as as a housewife as a mother but also uh, the role of woman as uh, uh, in economic uh, is in the economic uh, you know uh, as a as a merchant as a teacher and also as a you know, a, a kind of a, who also uh, have money to earn. And um, after that, uh, when ISIS was de declared, uh, the role of woman is more become becoming more uh, important, um, including um, when they are in, in active in the, in, the, in the field as a terrorist. Next, um, in, in, in our uh, next, in our uh, research, uh, in Paul Hukam's research with uh, Aman Indonesia, there is a such kind of push factors and pull factors, uh, including um, how uh, the woman feel uh, the moral degradation in the, the society is also uh, influence them, like the LGBTs, the pornography, the corruptions, um, the injusticeness of economic injustice also make them uh, change uh, their, their, their way of thinking. Um, uh, the disparity of economic disparities also make them uh, uh, try uh, changing, and also for sure the, the another issues um, uh, include uh, becoming more as a push factors. The pull factors for sure that um, the feeling of uh, what you call it a sin, sin is a feeling because they usually do the uh, more a free lifestyle. Uh, a, a lack of spirituality among the women is also become uh, one of the pull factors to become uh, more active uh, terrorist. Um, the collective uh, scene also from the parents, the 
with you know the the the, the brothers uh, of of them, and also uh, their active roles uh, because of um, the the promise of the ISIS or JI and in 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 the world aftermath. Next, um, this is a kind of a pathway of to radicalism, uh, whether we this is through online or through offline. Next, and I think uh, we can we can we can. Uh, uh, omit this, uh, pass this one. Next, please. So now, next. Now is about the terrorist financing itself. Well, in Indonesia, we don't have a, a specifically what we call it a terrorist financing legislation and uh, legislation and regulation that aim for only for women. But um, we do. Uh, I think it's more than dozens of regulations next um, on uh, terrorist financing. Um, we have a law number five, for example, on the concerning terrorist eradication, which is also include uh, terrorist financing. Law number 16 uh, concerning mass organization or what you call it now, civil society organizations, the presidency regulations uh, concerning procedure for the donation, acceptance and granting by civil society organization in the prevention of uh, terrorist financing crimes, uh, the FSA regulation or financial system uh, service uh, authority or OJK in Indonesia uh, on the implementation of anti-money, anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing in the financial service mm -hmm. sector. And um, I think also the joint regulations of the chief of the Supreme Court of the Republic of Indonesia, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, chief of Indonesian Police, the head of Indonesian Counterterrorism Agency, and the head of uh, uh, Intact concerning the inclusion of the people and cooperation identities in the list of suspected terrorists and terrorist organizations. Because in 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 this uh, last regulation, as I mentioned, uh, more based also on the activities on the terrorist financing. Uh, so one or two uh, people or organization can be. Uh, put in the uh, terrorist uh, list in Indonesia. Next, at least there are four ways, types of uh, terrorist financing in Indonesia. Um, as you know, the direct solicitation uh, through email, through web, chat, uh, you know, uh, social media, and also through the e-commerce. The e-commerce is now becoming uh, important uh, to be uh, seen because uh, now behind the e-commerce, behind the, uh, you know, uh, 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 economic application, for example, like uh, Tokopedia or Libri or whatever, um, they also, we suspect that they also a kind of a, some percentage that uh, the money goes to the terrorist financing. Um, the exploitation or, or the purchasing of hacking or fraud, um, uh, this is uh, just happened to, to, to my family uh, last month. My, my mom's uh, uh, credit card was, was fraud, was hacked by someone and we managed to track it. And then the money goes to one of the organization with, which we know have a, a link to ISIS in, the, in, the, in the Syria. So this also happened. The last one, the last type is a charity funding. This is a very important, but I will, I will talk about this uh, later on. Next. So this is the, the this is a kind of a fundraising uh, from the nonprofit organization that uh, goes through social media. Um, one is about the foster parents uh, through the orphanage. Uh, we don't know. Who's, who's the parents? Who's, we don't know who's the, 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 the orphans itself, but the money is, is, is there. Uh, the other one is uh, a campaign on a specific uh, project, for example, like here, Winter Project Surya or a project for Palestine, something like that. We don't know, we never know whether the money goes to Surya or to the, to the Palestine or goes to uh, somewhere else. And for sure, the third one is the uh, from through the uh, registered uh, foundation, but uh, again we don't know where is the money goes. Whether it goes to the uh, terrorism terrorism uh, abroad or to, to other uh, places. And last one, this is a uh, also important is um, 
the fundraising through the Indonesian migrant workers. As uh, already uh, Sylvia had mentioned about the role of the migrant workers, Indonesian two, two Indonesian migrant workers, I think uh, now this issue is become more, more uh, important to understand. Next. Um, well, we, we next, please. Uh, actually, in Indonesia, we have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, back, back, uh, back again. Uh, yes. Um, 11 organizations or, uh, or, or ministries that uh, coordinate and synergize on the eradication of terrorist financing grants. Um, I think it's, this is a, uh, based on the uh, law number nine, uh, 2013, if I'm mistaken. Yes. And um, also the, the PPATK or Indonesian Financial Transaction Report and Analysis Center also has what they call a system, the SIPENDA. Next, which is uh, collecting the data, collecting the system of information on terrorist financing, uh, uh, terrorist financing applications. But again, um, this kind of uh, effort is never distinguished whether the, uh, the terrorist, the terrorist financer is, is, is a woman or, or a man. So this is a kind of more general uh, regulations and uh, yes, regulations. Next, for the last one, uh, this is the regulation, the, the newest regulations, uh, number seven of uh, presidential uh, regulations, number seven, 2000. 21, which is uh, about the National Action Plan for Preventing and Countering Violent Extremism uh, that leads to terrorism. Um, one of the, the issues there is how to increase awareness and resilience of women in violent extremism and fi financing terrorism through online platform. So we do a training, dissemination, creative, innovative campaign project in social media just to avoid any woman who involved in the uh, terrorist financing or even the terrorism or violent extremism. So we, we do have uh, some kind of uh, regulations there, uh, but uh, next, the finding is, is not uh, uh, yet that uh, happy one. Uh, even in the, in the, in the COVID-19 um, uh, era, one of the actors, uh, if you see, this, sorry, this is my Asia, but if you see in the in the column number three, one of the actors, uh, Ibu Rumatanga or her housewife, which is uh, they are also a target for the terrorist financing. So this is a kind of a situation that we're still facing now. And um, my uh, next slide, it's happened that um, as a, as again I mentioned that the, the charity uh, is uh, the charity. Uh, this play a very important role, and also the Indonesian migrant workers uh, is also playing important roles. Here, you know that um, last year we we unveiled twenty thousand, more than twenty thousand, uh, what you call it, a kotak amal uh, charity box um, from the one of the foundations that uh, has a relation with the eyes. Uh, this been tracked as a uh, part of the terrorist financing. And just last week, uh, we had a 5,000 report that uh, uh, money is as related, related to the uh, terrorist financing. Out of 5,000, we have uh, uh, 261 has been, uh, now has been tracked and been, been investigated by the, uh, by the police and also by other. Uh, interesting thing, uh, even that we are, we are, and this is my last comment. I think even that we are not distinct, distinct uh, between a male and uh, female uh, terrorist financer. But in the case of Indonesia, we should understand as the, uh, before Vasilvi uh, already mentioned that we have a lot of Indonesian migrant workers, which I think is more than sixty percent are women. So we have to make. Uh, uh, have a more uh, careful investigation on this one, because whether we like it or not, uh, they, are, they also play a role uh, as, as happened uh, with the two Indonesian migrant workers uh, uh, last time. So 
I think that's that's my last comment. And I think, Mbak Ami, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm open to for a discussion. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Yeah. Terima kasih, Bapak Pribadi. Just very quickly, uh, Bapak, uh, um, Bapak himself uh, became a victim of hacking his mother's credit card. I, this is very interesting. Was was hacked and linked to a uh, uh, ISIS link uh, organization. Yes. Uh, uh, were you very shocked, Bapak? Uh, <laughs> yes, of course, Ibu. <laughs> Yeah, and, and also uh, uh, Bapak highlighted that uh, there were more than 20,000 charity boxes which police suspected to have collected money for, uh, for terror-linked organizations. I think if I'm not mistaken, it was mostly linked to Jama Islamia. Yeah, Jama Islamia. Uh, and that has been going on for, for quite a while and, and people who put the money in a box uh, does not necessarily know where the, the money is going uh, going to, uh, you also highlighted that uh, some of these charities that collect money are also suspicious, like organizations linked to to humanitarian aid for Syria and also also for for Palestine. And just like Malaysia uh, and also in the Philippines, uh, there has not been much successful prosecution of for for terror uh, financing a, a crime. So I, I think the challenge here uh, is is for um, governments and also uh, security agencies uh, to provide evidence. And as we all know that, and as we all can see from this webinar that technology has helped uh, militant groups uh, in raising funds and, uh, and avoiding detection. And having said that uh, terror financing is, is, uh, is something that is very vital to understand and also to, to cut off because without money, terrorists will not be able to fund their, the, their supply of weapons, their explosive material, their logistics uh, of moving people from one place to another, and also, I guess, paying for fake passports as a, as a former JI leader, Nasir Abbas, has, has spoken about before. So with that, uh, we'd like to open this session now for Q&A. So uh, uh, feel free to drop in your question uh, to, the, to the chat box. Uh, we have a question here for... Chief Norma, uh, this is from uh, Pakar. So um, the question is, um, uh, Pakar's research has found a Malaysian woman radicalizing Indonesians through WhatsApp and Telegram groups. Could you please enlighten us uh, what Special Branch has done to stop her activities online? Amy, can you can you repeat uh, that uh, question again? Someone just asked me to sign a document just now. I, I didn't pay attention. Sorry. No, Please. no, it's okay. So, a uh, Paka research uh, has from their monitoring online. They discovered a Malaysian woman um, mm -hmm. who is radicalizing Indonesians through their WhatsApp and Telegram groups uh, with radical content. Uh, oh. They would like to know uh, whether. Uh, SB is uh, has noticed her and is doing anything to stop her activities. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, we are aware about that, and we started uh, monitoring her since uh, early 2020. And uh, <coughs> later, uh, we would like to, like you know, like any other person uh, involved in terrorism activities, we would like to arrest her, but. Uh, after having a very deep uh, thought uh, discussion with my bosses, my directors, for that matters, they said she is a woman and uh, and also have a, a, a very young child. So they wanted us to probe further. So we go into uh, you know like we go and surveil her and see whether she is really capable of doing whatever she said. So, and then later we found out that uh, this uh, so-called Nasuha, her name is Nasuha, uh, is a lady who have a very hollow uh, life or background because she have a failed marriage, the first marriage, uh, the two children with the first husband has, uh, I mean, the first husband have uh, taken custody of the child. Uh, she was uh, disowned uh, by her family. She 
she is not uh, she she is not employed even until now so she like you know waiting for someone and uh, later in her life she married remarried to another man in Trengganu so they stay in Trengganu but because of this uh, emptiness she started to <coughs> dwell in the uh, whatsapp group telegram group and whenever she is online she became someone with so like you know having this uh, uh, different type of personalities she become the administrator of many whatsapp group and she has a penchant of using uh, fruits as the whatsapp group apple pear cherry things like that and uh, after after that uh, much deliberation uh, finally we engage her because we have studied the background we engage her and we found out she is not capable if we if we look into the formula of threat threat is equal to uh, intent plus capability just like water eh? h2o if you want to have water you have to have h two, two atom of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen then only you have water so threat in this case for nasuha she is only uh, rhetorically in all his in all her postings uh, she didn't have that capability uh, to <coughs> to execute whatever uh, whatever threat that she posts in 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 the group and also in terms of re religious knowledge she can't even differentiate between the arabic script and the jawi uh, a malay using uh, Jawi is a, a Malay writing using uh, Arabic uh, alphabet, right? So she don't even know that. But but uh, because of the social media, give people uh, this uh, fake persona. So when she is in, uh, she's online, she becomes somewhat someone else. But when we meet her, now we already met her five times so we are now <clears throat> in the process of uh, engaging her with a local religious uh, organization so that they can do all this direct program on her uh, on a <clears throat> weekly basis and on a monthly basis we uh, go down to Trengganu to visit her so maybe <clears throat> right now you can see the activity is uh, you know uh, slow down a little bit and I, I, I do understand that she is so uh, unfortunately her husband uh, died uh, just uh, just uh, two months ago and uh, she is really like looking for someone she said I wanted to go to Indonesia to marry uh, a mujahid if I don't have anyone in Indonesia uh, maybe some whoever who wanted to marry her so that is sounds so that's that's prado so that's about uh nasuha uh, thank you very much back to you uh emmy uh, Chief Norma, maybe just uh, one question for me. Uh, just want to very quickly ask you, uh, you mentioned about uh, people taking out personal loans to go to Syria. Um, is there any figure for the total amount that they've taken from the banks and, uh, and, and what happened to the bank loans? Uh, did anyone pay up or, or you can write off those bank loans? Okay, uh, uh, the bank also engaged us sometimes to give talk. So we tell the banks so whenever you offer because banks they are very competitive here in Malaysia so they give all kind of uh, you know uh, like promotion so uh, 10 uh, 10000 ringgit uh, personal loan uh, without guarantee nothing no questions asked so they will go for that kind of loan they make a loan with the intention not 
to pay back. So we have won uh, the bankers here. So to be careful when they offer things like that, they have to like, you know, uh, interview people a bit. And then if they have some suspicious uh, uh, feeling, uh, you know, contact us and we will do a background check quietly from behind. Yeah, that's it. Back to you, Amy. Yeah. Thank you, Chief Norma. There's a question here for Dre. Uh, uh, there's a question here for Nonviolent Peace Force. And the question is, do you have a data about the problem of terrorism in the Philippines um, that 90% is caused by communism and 10% by Islamic radicalism? This is based on our research, based on the number of reports that the National Task Force to End Local Communist Armed Conflict had to resolve. So there is no specific task force that had to be created for uh, radicalization of Islamic groups. We do have uh, specific uh, groups that will have to deal with the Abu Sayyaf. Uh, we also have specific uh, groups that deal with um, MILF, MNLF, BIFF, but not a special task force. And this special task force had to be created after more than 50 years of the creeping cancer of communism in the Philippines, deeply infiltrating our government. So the problem here, then the reason that it is 90% is because the Islamic groups that are, have been infiltrated by radicals they do not have any political representation as yet in the Philippine government. So they are in, although the Marawi siege was, was a very devastating war that uh, ripped our country, only 10% of Marawi city itself was affected by the siege because it was well contained by the Philippine Armed Forces and the Philippine National Police. It was properly contained in the 10% of the main city area of Marawi. And other than the Marawi siege and the, the skirmishes of conflict that we have to deal with as caused by Abu Sayyaf, as caused by our... Uh, problems with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the Moro National Liberation Front. Uh, they do not have the same political representation hey, uh, as a terrorist up to organization. Date. Yeah, up to date, darling. And, <laughs> and <laughs> at the same time, uh, and at the same time, uh, our Islamic brothers and oh, sisters okay. with, the, with the introduction of BARM, they have uh, many of the insurgents uh, related to the Islamic terrorist groups before have already returned to the fold of the law. And so we do have data on communist terrorists. What we do not have in the Philippines is terrorism financing convictions related to these uh, CPP, NTA, and NDF communist terrorists because uh, our Anti-Terrorism Act, the strong anti-terrorism law, was only passed in 2020. And the National Democratic Front, the legal arm or the shield of the communist terrorist group, was only designated by the Philippine government as a terrorist organization in 2021. So we, in, in terms of the question of why it is a 90-10 uh, ratio of uh, terrorist activities, uh, we do need the technical assistance and research support for uh, terrorism financing research from international agencies because AMLAC efforts are weak, inconsistent, and lacks focus. This is the reality on the ground. And the problem of AM AMLAC is probably incompetence. And I say this strongly because we lose a lot of soldiers and police officers and law-abiding citizens because of the incompetence of AMLAC. So the ATA 2020, the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, has a section on penalizing material support for terrorism, covering the provision of safe havens, transportation, weapons, ammunition, and any form of material support. However, 
the AMLAC takes the lead and they need to coordinate with police and military. But since AMLAC is weak, as I have mentioned prior, challenges abound. Our military and police are effective. They just need guidance from financial sector experts such as ourselves. And what we are emphasizing here is that uh, we, as, as, a, as a country, we are dealing with the problem of infiltration of mainstream media because there are a lot of covert communist terrorists that have key positions in media organizations. And this is where the perception, the, the wrong perception of um, stigmatizing our peace-loving Muslim brothers and sisters in Southern Philippines. We have more peace-loving Muslim brothers and sisters. And this is the fact because I have traveled all over the country I have covered all kinds of wars. Even during the Marawi siege, the ones who were capitalizing on the chaos were the communist terrorists on the ground. They were radicalizing the internally displaced persons while pretending to be NGO workers. So wh while the government is doing its best to help the IDPs uh, that had been affected by the Marawi siege, the communist terrorists were the ones tapping into the pre-existing chaos. And there is a study on the CPP, NPA, NDF, ISIS nexus, because we have linked the, the ISIS group, Abu Sayyaf, and, and although they have different ideologies with the CPP, NPA, NDF, they do merge strategically for terrorism financing and tapping into the political network of the CPP and the NDF. So that is my answer regarding the 9010 question. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, thank you, Dre. Uh, just a follow-up question for Chief Noma from, uh, from Mas Anung Norahmi. Uh, Mas wants to ask, uh, is it possible that when uh, Nur Suha, the lady who was behind this uh, radical chat group, uh, she, uh, you said that she became a different Persona. The question is, uh, is it possible that, that it is not really her who was, uh, who was the admin of the group and that it could possibly be someone else who is using her name? Thank you. Uh, I, no, it's, it's her because uh, we have checked. She has at least four uh, different uh, mobile numbers. Okay, and then uh, while doing surveillance, uh, she is almost like the the eyes is on the hand on the smartphone, uh, you know, for many hours, and then uh, uh, the husband also complained uh, to another relative saying that uh, Nasra is you know con concentrating on on the on the uh, mobile phone all day long and you know, uh, buying data more than 200 ringgits, uh, you know, in few weeks time. So that is the complaint. So she is on the, she is online. <laughs> yeah, she is online. Uh, no one else. I think she is. So, but uh, we are trying our best to like, you know, uh, uh, direct her. Uh, not through the justice system, it's outside the justice system. So we, we bring her back to, to, you know, to the right path. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Noma. Okay, there is a Badete who wants to ask questions. Silakan, Badete. Is Badete still here? Yeah, uh, because, thank you, um, Mbak Ami. And I want to ask Chief Norma. Because I think if I uh, write in the chat box, it's too long, yeah. So I think I better talk. <laughs> so yeah, Chief Norma, Cyan, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit curious actually, and I was questioning this time many times. And I even when I met the, how to say, uh, the terrorist offender from Malaysia, like Nasir Abbas, and when I went to Malaysia, I met one uh, of them, and then I asked, Do you already have agreement between Malaysia and Indonesia? Who will do what? Because I. I noticed that there is a how can like there is a division of labor between the Malaysian and Indonesians, yeah, and towards the upper the bombing action or whatever violence extremism acts, yeah. That is first my question. Do you notice that actually is there from your 
surveillance is there you find in their communication the division of labor between these three um, uh, the filipino the indonesian and the malaysians yeah in any occasions of the how to say violence extremism bomb uh, x secondly about the women because i noticed your presentations there are many women actually caught by malaysian uh, police uh, who are suspected involved in violence extremism and what uh, uh, make me curious is that why the malaysian women never uh, never do violence acts in their own country and also uh, i mean like indonesia you know that many indonesian women do the acts they do the violence act inside indonesia they do the bombing they do many things every roles they played in indonesia and i'm 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 observed in malaysia there is no women taking any how to say a violence act, especially bombing inside the country what makes them doesn't have the courage to do it to do this either your regulation is so strict or they don't have a courage or what uh, uh, chinora because i really wonder i'm really curious actually so that's why when you are here i really have this is i think a good opportunity to ask you <laughs> maybe you have the how to say from your surveillance uh, information you can get the information why the women doesn't dare enough to do the violence acts inside the country that is only my question okay. uh, bu norada terima kasih banyak ya for yeah, your okay. time yeah te- uh, terima kasih bu uh, okay uh, first the first question first uh, i don't think that uh, we have this type of division of labors or Uh, some sort of agreement MOU between uh, extremists, uh, terrorists uh, among the three countries. I don't think so. Uh, it's like more towards standalone uh, uh, situation for each countries. But the only the only thing that uh, we have that maybe uh, Philippines and Indonesia don't have is that they are making our country like safe heaven uh, due to the uh, porous border, especially like in Sabah, uh, right? Uh, for both Philippines and, uh, and Indonesia. So if you are making a, a place, an area as your safe heaven, will you go and bomb the area? Definitely not because you cannot come back to that safe heaven. So. I believe uh, even for the holo holo bombing uh, in uh, in uh, in holo the cathedral bombing in January 2019 I believe uh, even the anti baso group they just transiting in Malaysian uh, area before going to uh, southern Philippines so and uh, the the poor thing is they Uh, perceive southern philippines as the next provincial ca- ca- the next provincial caliphate uh, that uh, everyone is going there as a jihad land so that's why in philippines they have foreign terrorist fighters uh, from the middle east and a uh, few other countries including uh, malaysia and indonesia so uh, they are only transiting uh, at our area and uh, when doing that they try very much not to have confrontation with law enforcement so uh, all movement are done very secretly and quietly so that uh, they can always use and uh, go go to the southern philippines so that is in terms of uh, you know uh, like ibu just just now mentioned whether we have cooperation or mou not us not not us the, the the law enforcement the the terrorists themselves so i don't think so i don't think so even i can say uh, for sure even uh, terrorists not from our region from far away region like from the middle east from the sahel region uh, maybe some from europe are uh, also like transiting uh, in, in malaysia and maybe they will go to korea to other parts of the world but because uh, malaysia have such a very friendly immigration regime 
whereby we accepted uh, most of OIC countries uh, visitors to come uh, with visa on arrival. So that is one of the pulling factors that they like to come and transiting here. And uh, then we don't know when they, you know, when they uh, finally pursue the, the next uh, gen the next leg of their journey. So that is about that. So and next one is uh, about the question about why women didn't <laughs> didn't uh, you know do such uh, uh, act of terrorism here here in Malaysia. Uh, I <laughs> how to say about this? I believe uh, our our people, uh, our people don't really have that staying power. Uh, like in Indonesia, uh, majority, basically uh, about 90% of the population are Muslim. Here in Malaysia, we have quite a balanced uh, demography uh, between uh, native, uh, they call it Bumi Putra here, Bumi Putra about 60%. And non Bumi Putra about forty percent. So uh, we have Bumi Putra sixty percent, and then we have about Chinese twenty percent. Another ten percent is uh, Indian, and another ten percent like uh, you know the the mix of the rest of our population. But within that sixty percent of uh, Bumi Putra, uh, maybe about ten percent uh, non uh, Muslim Bumi Putra. A native from Sabah and Sarawak, so meaning we have like a very balanced uh, demography uh, that contain the extremism activities here. Because if you if this group uh, doing something, there is always check and balance from another group. So at last they like maintain the status quo because there is always a check and balance. Uh, and then I don't know whether I like to put a blame in our education system that, uh, uh, that, that produce, uh, you know, citizens uh, that is not that resilience, you know, to have that staying power uh, to, 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 to pursue their things. So that's why here in Malaysia, we have that peak and valley. We have peak during the, the first Taliban era uh, and then narrowed down. And then we have another peak when uh, IS uh, started their caliphate in Syria. So that is the two peak and two valley. Uh, and then with this COVID also, uh, has, COVID has like managed to hamper their activities uh, due to the hardship. Uh, the staying power is not there. That's why even COVID can weaken them. That's my answer, Ibu. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Chief Norma. Uh, we also have a uh, Bapak Pribadi Sutiono. His hands uh, is raised. He wishes to ask a question. Silakan, Pak. Well, uh, I just want to exercise my rights to ask the question, Bami. <laughs> uh, <laughs> silakan, silakan. <laughs> thank you. Uh, actually, my, my question is to, uh, to Dre. Um, I, I just my curiosity, actually, about the, uh, the Masra, um, Marawi issues. Um, as, as we know that um, one of the leaders of uh, Marawi, the Mautes family, uh, the wife is, is, uh, was uh, Indonesian. So, and, and we, we heard uh, from uh, the government of the Philippines that uh, he, she is the one who actually, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the financer of, uh, of, of this, this movement. Uh, is that, is that still true, or is there any 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 development on on this? Because, uh, well, uh, to be frank, I'm 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 lost of this information. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, regarding your question about Minhati, uh, she had already been deported by the Philippine government. She is already back in Indonesia with her family, uh, also with her children, her four daughters and her two sons. Uh, so all of them are back in Indonesia and they are, uh, at, of course, at the mercy of the Indonesian government for how uh, they will be properly punished for, at least for the mother, to be punished for the terrorism financing crimes that she had committed with uh, Maute uh, Philippine Daesh. And um, in relation to this, the, she is not the only source of terrorism financing. She was 
a key player, of course, in the terrorism financing for the three years before the siege. Uh, she played a very key role along with Karhana Maute uh, for the distribution of uh, funds uh, throughout the Lanao area, especially uh, the, the money that was used by the ISIS-linked imams uh, was also coming from Midrais and also from Farhana Maute. But in relation to the undergoing deradicalization under the Indonesian government, uh, of course, it is our hope that uh, she will be able to overcome her radical ideology and that she will be able to nurture her four daughters and two sons to uh, veer away from the indoctrination of ISIS ideology, which, of course, they were uh, influenced by, especially the daughters, the, the elder daughters, um, because of their grandmother, uh, Farhana Maute. Now, um, in the Philippines, the role of both Medrais and Farhana um, is limited in the sense that the terrorism financing for Daesh was not limited to Lanao. We know that for a fact that in the Luzon area, and we have actually issued a warning uh, to the different intelligence groups of the Philippine government, that there is a fundraising being done by a certain faction of Daesh Philippines that had uh, left uh, the Marawi siege area and had sought refuge in different parts of Luzon. Uh, some some ha are taking refuge uh, within Metro Manila. Others are taking refuge in the western part of Luzon. And in these areas, they are being able to do fundraising. Uh, in the middle of the pandemic, it is not um, it, it, it's not necessarily less terrorism financing and fundraising that is ongoing because they do have online shops. <laughs> What's very interesting is that uh, there is a phenomenon of a proliferation of online selling. And uh, what would stand out is that um, it's similar to the case of uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, where some of the women involved in terrorism financing, they are engaged in online selling of very affordable uh, and fashionable clothes dresses and that that if you look at the price um it is not economically viable for other sellers to sell it at that price and i'm talking about really beautiful uh dresses muslim dresses that are going to cost you somewhere around 2000 pesos or 1500 pesos at the least in um, shops with very small markup but in these uh, online shops they're able to sell it for 300 pesos, 200 pesos, and they sell it by uh, bulk, you know? And so the, there is a creative uh, resource generation. And uh, at the moment, our government is just in the process of monitoring. But as I said, we do need a stronger AMLAC to be able to have terrorism convictions because we do not want to wait for another bombing. Like in the case of the Holo bombing, uh, my team and I, we were actually warning the Philippine government about the onslaught of uh, female-led suicide bombers after the Marawi siege because in our tracking down of the child soldiers, we were also able to find that there were girls and teenage uh, girls that were being uh, groomed by ISIS for uh, making bombs. And so we predicted that there will be female suicide bombers. At the time that we issued the report, we were being laughed at. We were being, you know, we were being ridiculed and uh, some were dismissing our warnings. Why? Because there was not, no uh, prior case of women or, or girls involved in suicide bombing in the Philippines. And then we said, yes, not, not before, but now there will be. Just wait for a few years, probably a few months it will happen because we saw them, we were in the area that the soldiers could not enter, that the police could not enter. And the reason we could enter was because we were female, you know? And, and these are areas that men, armed men uh, from the government security forces cannot easily penetrate. But because we are women, we can easily go to these places. And 
Also because the mothers, there are mothers who are concerned. There are grandmothers who are concerned. There are aunties who are concerned, who do not want their children or their nephews or uh, you know, their sisters or their brothers to be recruited by ISIS. However, there is a very liquid way of fundraising. By liquid, I mean some of them, they do online selling and then that money, it's hard to trace. In, at least within the system of, of Philippines, when we were warning them that, look, the, if you compute the online sales, it is more than sufficient that they can raise enough money for suicide bombers. Because the suicide bombers in the Philippines, by the way, they are not driven by ideology. They do not, do, they do not blow themselves up because they believe in something. They blow themselves up because they have been assured of one million for their family. Some of them are, are given 4 million. So 2 million in advance and 2 million on the day that they will blow themselves up. So it's the, the pecuniary incentive for them to become suicide bombers is because of the money. So uh, this has not stopped even after Medrais was already uh, relocated to Indonesia. So as with your question, uh, she had a big role prior, but she is not the only one for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dre. Uh, we're running out of time, so maybe we'll take about two, three more questions. So we have here from Nonviolence Peace Force. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Thank you, Annie, for recognizing. Um, also for Dre, uh, I would like to, um, maybe this is just dig digressing a bit away from the main issue of uh, terrorism financing, but still related to terrorism. I, I'm wondering, I'm curious, Ray, if you have information about reports about how women or in general, the population in Southern Philippines reacting to the developments in, uh, in Afghanistan after the, the takeover of the Taliban now, the retake of the Taliban of the government is there any information that point to how Muslim Filipinos in the Philippines are reacting to it? The way we have seen in Indonesia, for instance, how some glorification or some celebrations are monitored. Is there any similar in, in Mindanao particularly or in, in maybe in other parts of the country? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, it is still under the analysis. It's still under observation. But thus far, we do not see any support, uh, at least coming from Mindanao. Uh, the groups there with the implementation of the BARM initiative of the national government, uh, they do not have any, uh, thus far, there is no brewing sympathy for the terrorist organizations that may be coming from uh, neighboring countries in Southeast Asia. And um, we, we do have a very strict, at, at the moment, we have a, a stricter uh, DFA when it comes to the Department of Foreign Affairs, when it comes to uh, the agreement of uh, President Rodrigo Roa Duterte to take in some of the educated women and girls from Afghanistan. So the Department of Foreign Affairs is working closely with the uh, Armed Forces of the Philippines in relation to uh, the refugees, the educated women and girls especially. Uh, so we are uh, making sure that those that uh, will be included in the program uh, for refugees uh, that will be staying in the Philippines will not be adding to the radicalization uh, in Southern Philippines. But thus far, we are okay. We do not see any link as yet. We will be making an update. We, we are observing in the next few months. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dre. Uh, with that, we conclude uh, this webinar. It's been a really amazing session. And, uh, and thank you very much to all the uh, amazing ladies and uh, and uh, the gentleman, uh, Bapak Pribadi Sutiono. So once again, thank you to Ibu Sylvia Lachmi uh, uh, from, from Australian National University, Dre Toledo, Salamat Po, thank you so much. And, uh, and to Deputy Commissioner Norma Ishak, 
thank you so much and uh, Bapak Pribadi. Uh, it, was, uh, it was really very interesting and, and I think we learned a lot from listening to this session. And I want to wish everyone uh, all the best in your, in your work. Uh, all of you are doing amazing work and, and thank you so much for keeping the region safe. Terima kasih and sampai ketemu lagi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terima kasih, Mbak Ami. Thank you. Yeah, so much, Thank you. Terima kasih semuanya. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sampai ketemu lagi. Sampai ketemu lagi. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye.